tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 23. I'm your host, Otis Gyrie, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Michael Page, about disturbing dogs, deadly drunks, calculating cryptids, and reckless research. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail so lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> A lonely journey home at night. We've all had them at one point or another. But in our first tale by Michael Page, we hear a recounting of an ill-advised trip home through the woods that led to a gruesome encounter, and how sometimes you can run from your past, but it has a way of catching up to you if you're not careful. Without further ado, I present to you, Forever and Always. Everybody loves the woods, until they follow you home. When my father came back from the military, we bought our first house boxy two-story affair on the woodsy outskirts part of town. I was 12, going on 13 then. Our neighborhood was a little off the beaten path, nestled somewhere between shaded canopy roads and miles upon miles of Tallahassee timber. After school, if I didn't have a scout meeting or any more chores left, I'd hop on my bike to find friends to hang out with. The only rule was to be home before the streetlights came on. Throughout all my childhood, my folks never asked where I was going or what I was doing for the day. Times were different back then, I guess. My summers were spent playing in the woods with my friends. It was the perfect place to turn off the world for a while, like you were miles away from any sort of responsibility. Nothing but dirt and adventure we played war for hours, following deer trails, 
bridge jumping into freezing creeks and always knew to get the hell out of Dodge when riders blasted their way down the trails. The last of us to move always won. Honestly speaking, we were no different than any other group of dumb kids hurting themselves for laughs and style points. Self-injury is the oldest form of amusement, after all. And for a group of skinny, bored desperados, how could we not be just a little bit reckless? Sprained ankles, bleeding arms, and scuffed knees were all par for the course. My friend Joel pulling a tree branch back and letting it fly straight into the face of Teddy Mare. It struck Teddy so hard his head whipped back and his lip inflated like a balloon. He lost his last baby tooth that day. Sometimes, if we ever felt up to it, we'd make the trek to Hollow Sink Park to stare at the sinkholes that tourists came to gawk at. The park was littered with them, but we mostly went to see the Dismal Maw. At least, we did, until some kid drowned in it. A friend of mine once said he saw the boy's white face staring at him from the black water. I figured he was full of crap. I knew the woods like the back of my hand, and other than a decent escape for us, they also became a series of shortcuts we could use to each other's houses, lickety split. Hard to get lost if you memorized landmarks and stuck to the damn trail. Neglecting that is how most poor souls ended up on the news. One evening I was with Joel in his garage trying to complete our construction of a bike ramp for the summer. Despite the sky draining to a dense, bruised color, I stupidly let him razz me into staying just a bit longer to get more of the ramp done. If not for the looming threat of my old man ripping me a new one, We'd probably have had it all finished, but I waved him off and rode the bike home. I decided to cut through the woods. It was my only chance to beat the automatic circuits of the streetlights that were waiting for enough light to disappear. I followed down the path as it dipped into a creek and then smoothed out into a single-track lane. Wet clods flew off my tires as the gears buzzed and jittered along the trail. I was still saving up for one of the fancier rock hoppers that riders used, but until then my clunky hybrid was enough to get me around. The sun dropped like a beacon in the distance, taking away what time I had left. I had to hurry. I kicked it up a notch, speeding through the trees and the Spanish moss that hung from them like a hippie's dreadlocks. But just as I crested the brow of the hill, I suddenly had to stop. My upper body jerked forward off the seat as I slammed on the brakes and brought myself to a crunching halt along the grit. Ahead of me, just a yard or so away, the body of a white-tailed deer blocked the path. It was lying on its side, all four legs splayed out from under it. The skin had been torn away from its back, leaving the pelt to sag around the exposed flesh, damp with blood. Great chunks of meat were gone carved out by sharp teeth from whatever had killed it. Somewhere within the ragged, chewed muscle, I thought I could make out the semblance of a spine. A fresh kill. Predators weren't uncommon here, but they mostly stuck to the human-free spaces of the forest. As many times as we explored this place, we very seldomly ever saw them. Something moved out of the undergrowth. My eyes snapped toward it. My heels instinctively scraped the earth to back the bike up. A large black hound. It was a mangy-looking thing, romping out of the covert and toward the corpse. A wolf, I thought, as my eyes traced the thickets for any more signs of movement. There didn't seem to be any, though. Taking no notice of me, the dog bowed its head and began to sink its teeth into the carcass, pulling and tearing off more parts. The hound was covered in tangles of dark, scanty fur. I'd never seen a dog's coat so black, like it was more of a dog-shaped silhouette than anything else. The same pitch as a starless night sky. I backed away slowly, 
trying to raise as much distance from it and me as possible as I rotated the bike around. A few rocks shifted and scuffled loudly under my tire. I'd moved too quickly. The dog reared its shaggy head toward me. I stopped moving. Its body rose up and stiffened, the side of its dark muzzle quivering. Ropey strings of saliva dripped off its chin, falling over the remnants of what was once a deer's jugular, now gripped in its teeth. The dog was big, maybe the size of a mastiff, maybe just a bit bigger. But what sent the ripple of static down my spine was the single white saucer it had for an eye, dead center, bulging outward from the animal's head. The eye held a vague whiteness without any hint of sight. The dog's body lunged forward just as I twisted around and started beating the pedals. I went full throttle, riding the downhill burst at breakneck speed. It's not after you, I told myself. It just wants you away from the deer. It doesn't want you. But it was coming. I knew it was. My bike wavered wildly back and forth along the rugged earth. I was standing up, pumping the pedals madly and forcing the handlebars still. Against every instinct not to do it, I chanced to look back. It was right on me, closer than I even pictured. The frothing, grinning teeth were mere inches from my rear wheel. I could see the bits of deer stuck between them. I could even see into that grotesque white eye and the faint, milky pupil staring at me behind the film. From out of its mouth, a pale, ghostly tongue slithered in and out. Despite how close it was, as crazy as this is to say, I couldn't hear it moving. Its legs, which were pounding into the earth to keep up with me, weren't making any sound at all. No crunching leaves, no haggard panting. Just a silent shape drawing closer. I honestly thought I'd gone deaf in the panic. I could smell it, though. The pungent odor of blood and mange. All I could do was push harder, pumping my legs like engines that revved higher and higher. Air battered against my face, none of it making it to my lungs. The trees synced up in my peripheral vision like slides on a projector screen. I pulled the phlegm down my throat. I veered to the right, ducking through a ribcage of skinny branches and then onto a connecting trail. One branch got my cheek, trickling out some blood. I risked another look. My swerve had gained some space between us. Screw you, lassie, my thoughts jeered as I pushed on. Then the world upturned. My body was flung forward like a rag doll as I crashed headfirst into the earth. No chance to adjust or recover. I fell hard. The wind was knocked out of me. Colors and textures became red and gritty. My palms were scraped raw, both knees bleeding. I gathered my bearings, trying to put together what had just happened. My bike was lying next to me. Its old chain snapped completely. The black shape of the dog was growing larger. It hadn't quit. I kicked off the dirt and broke off toward the closest, fattest tree I could find. Luckily, a large enough oak was nearby. I planted one dirt-streaked sneaker against it and pushed upward with the other. My hand stretched and managed to grab hold of one of the overhead branches. I pulled myself up and swung my leg over. At last, a sound reached me. The clack of teeth had barely missed their mark. The dog fell on its side in silence and quickly scrambled back to its feet. Go away, I screamed at it. Go away! The dog's face scrunched into a snarl, teeth bared, yet no sound came from it. Foam dribbled over its lips, the gums as white and bloodless as the tongue they shared a space with. Why? Why was it so driven to chase after me? Why was it so freakishly silent? Because it wants to hunt, and you're the next catch, my thoughts answered. I wiped some blood off my cheek, gasping as realization finally caught up with me. I shuffled on the branch, patting down my pockets and turning them inside out. My phone was gone. 
My eyes scanned around for it, eventually finding its shape, lying next to the broken chain left there from my tumble. Frustration flared. I smacked the trunk with the side of my fist, crunching one of the lichens growing there into flaky debris. Nobody knew where I was, save for Joel, who must have known I'd take the shortcut home. Maybe my folks will call his parents to say I hadn't made it back yet. Maybe they'd call the police to come looking for me in the woods. Maybe they wouldn't find me. I shook out the thoughts. Too many maybes. I sighed, wincing at the sting in my palms. At a side glance, I caught something on the tree, carved deeply into its gray bark. No names or initials, just the vague shape of a cat's head. The sun went down as more of the forest lost its color. The black hound paced and panted around the tree, its glare never leaving me. I stared longingly at the rocks surrounding us, wishing I'd be able to grab a few before climbing so that I could peg them at its face, especially at that single cyclops eye. A deformity, I thought, thinking of all the different sorts of birth defects, like two-headed snakes or an eight-legged goat, Still, that didn't explain how the dog was so unnaturally muted, quiet as a ghost. Night had now set in, the dark shape appeared to finally lose interest, and vanished into the brush. I'd like to say I waited an hour longer in that tree, but it was probably closer to twenty or thirty minutes that I scanned the area restlessly, slowly building up the bravery to leave my roost. Somewhere beyond the thickets, a distant owl shrieked. I was ready. I made my way carefully down and planted both feet on the ground. It provided some relief, like I was one step closer to putting this all behind me. I made the few paces to my phone and scooped it off the dirt. The screen beamed with life. Six text messages and ten missed calls from home. No doubt they were waiting to discipline me when I got back, but that was the least of my problems. I arched my finger to return the call. Something fired out of the darkness, a flurry of silent thrashing legs and a pallid sickly orb pulling closer. I threw myself toward the tree, practically launching myself with each step as I beat desperately toward it. My hands once again gripped the branch and I hoisted myself up. This time I was too slow. Fangs found my leg and buried themselves deeply inside. Pain welled, shooting up in an erupting flare through me. Branches and leaves meshed in my vision. I let out an agonized cry. The bark splintered into my fingers, but I didn't dare let go. Somewhere in my mind, I pictured a bear trap clapping its iron teeth into Bambi. The hound, now balancing on its hind legs, shook its sizable neck muscles, trying to twist me back toward the ground. Its teeth dug further through the nerves, sending a flurry of pins and needles surging through my leg and scattering around my hip. With everything I could, I mustered my free leg up and kicked at its muzzle with my heel. Through some cosmic mercy, its jaws released. I swung my body the rest of the way up and planted myself back where the height favored me. Dark blood dripped down my leg and rolled over my sneaker. The pain heaved in waves and hot pulses. I buried my face against the gnarled bark and cried, not wanting to look at the wound, but I forced myself to peek at it. The teeth-shaped grooves left me light-headed. Don't faint, I snapped at myself. Don't you dare faint. I looked down. My phone once again lay on the ground. I couldn't help but cry some more. The dog sat there and stared up at me, its bulbous, cyclopean eye marking me in a world without end. Fresh blood, my blood this time, reddened the foam around its snout. It had waited the whole time, curing itself up for me to let my guard down so it could take me out. I wasn't just trapped up there. I was a bird with a broken wing. Thank Christ the hound couldn't climb. I bit back the tears, trying for a moment to picture myself acting tough in front of the guys. It helped somewhat. 
I resorted to calling out for help, hoping that just by chance, someone might hear me and come looking. The dog once again vanished into the tree line, but I knew there wasn't a chance in hell I was going down from the tree again. I could still feel the beast there watching me from the bracken, waiting with tireless patience. For the rest of the night, I smacked away the gnats and mosquitoes trying to eat me alive. Can't say I blamed them. I was probably a smorgasbord for their tiny alien mouths. I was cold, scared, and hurting. Every so often, another spasm of pain would shoot through my leg and fill my head with chilling thoughts. Nerve damage, infection, amputation. What if I could never run after this? What if there was nothing after this? It was impossible not to think about. Every time the panic flared back up again, I'd scream and shout for help until my throat went dry, desperately breathless. An eternity passed. The sky shifted into an orange-blue tone. Sunrise was on the way. Enough sunlight now began to brighten the forest. I fell back on shouting for help. Everything hurt. An attempting need to vomit roiled in the pit of my gut. I clung to the tree and shouted whenever air, enough air, allowed it. Hey, everything okay? A man's voice eventually called. I looked down. There was a young couple parked on waspy yellow bikes, both of them wearing lycra jerseys. They happened to be riding the trails that early morning and heard my cries. Kid! A tallish man called again. You okay? There, there's a dog, I shouted back. Watch out! Both their necks swiveled, but then returned to me. The man approached my tree. The braided-haired girl remained on the trail, watching cautiously. I expected the one-eyed dog to burst through the growth at any moment and fall upon the man, while the woman recoiled in horror. But nothing happened. The dog apparently had gone away. They took me to the hospital. I got several stitches for the bite, a tetanus shot, and the first of a scheduled series of five anti-rabies shots. I was half expecting to still be reamed by my folks for putting myself in that position, but they were just happy I made it back home. Going from offender to survivor will do that for you. Even as my friends ribbed me, calling me scared or too chicken, I refused to ever step back into that godforsaken place. For the next three or so years, I dreamed about the hound, but in my dreams I would never make it to that tree. My bike would fall apart, my legs would seize up completely, and even if I did reach the tree in some cases, the feeble branch I grabbed would snap and send me falling back into the jaws that wanted my life. In the summer of 2000, I went to prom with Riley Dean. She was a timid girl, surprisingly skittish for a cheerleader. We were absolute opposites, and to be honest with you, I never thought she'd say yes when I asked her to go with me. Halfway through the night, she couldn't find her inhaler. It had been left in my car. I set out to get it for her, I made my way across the parking lot, pulled the keys out of my pocket, and fiddled with a lock. From under the car, something snapped at my leg. I fell back onto the pavement with my hands and ass, breaking my fall. A black shape sprang forward from beneath the car and seized the cuff of my dress pants. It was back. The hound. That same oily fur, the wriggling, slinking white tongue and that one hellish eye, holding no signs of life. I screamed and kicked frantically, blubbering for help like a lost child. My pants' fabric ripped in its teeth. It launched again, this time finding flesh instead of polyester. The pain ripped through me, sending me five years back to that night in the woods screaming for help. Some people heard the commotion and ran over. The dog unclenched its teeth and ran off into the distance. I stared at the new ring of bite marks etched into my leg, marked once again. An ambulance was called, and poor Riley Dean's prom was cut short by an ambulance ride for her prom date. 
I wish I could say that it was some sick stroke of bad luck that I just so happened to run into the same dog that had attacked me years earlier. But it was more than that. It took me two years after the second ambush to realize it. I moved out of Tally and went out of state to pursue college. I couldn't afford to live on campus, so I ended up leasing a small place in a close enough town. The house had already been pre-installed with motion lights outside. One night while I was in the kitchen, I saw that the backyard sensors had gone up. Figuring it was a cat or some other small critter, I went to check it out. I opened the back door and looked out. What I saw made the glass of water slip from my hand and clatter onto the floor. All I could do was stand there, the inner parts of my throat seizing up and choking me, the sharp, mangy smell finding my nostrils again. Trauma always finds a way to come home. The hound sat in my backyard, back once again to take another piece out of me. Its mouth opened in a teeth-bearing growl, never to make a sound. I'm not finished, its large, lifeless eyes said. We aren't done yet. The scars on my leg burned, marked forever and always. I closed the door, locked it, and walked upstairs to my bedroom. There was not much else I could do. For half a moment, I actually thought about calling animal control and telling them a rabid dog was loose in my yard. The beast would be gone by then. It was always gone by then. The hound has come several times since then, bounding at me from a dark alley, leaping out from behind a tree, a shadow forever hunting me, and just how long until it burst out of my closet, gunning for my neck. I've since bought a pistol and loaded the chamber, and it never leaves my side. Who knows if it will ever do anything to that thing, but I'll die before it ever manages to catch me off guard again. Sometimes I even think about going back to Tally, where I know more kids are surely playing around those woods, exploring places, running into things they shouldn't. Go home! Stay out of the woods, I'd shout at them. Stay out of those woods. I hope you enjoyed Forever and Always by author Michael Page, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first tale, and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash page. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash P-A-I-G-E. Yes, with an I, like the one looking at you through your keyhole right now. View even more of his works of woe at his WordPress blog, but don't say I didn't warn you. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please leave Michael a kind word and let him know you heard about him on this show and that Otis sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Hope you've recovered enough from our last tale. Just for your own safety, should you ever see a one-eyed dog wandering around in the dead of night, just make sure you have something tasty to give it. A sandwich, a stick of gum, or that bratty relative you just can't stand the sight of. Otherwise, it just might follow you home. But truly, are the one-eyed creatures of the world the true monsters among us? No, surely it's in the heart of your fellow human beings. Some time ago, I read a story by Michael Page, and for our second tale of the evening, he's asked us to share the continuing story from that world. But for those of you at home, don't worry. Unlike the bodies under the porch, this one stands well enough on its own. Without further ado, I present to you, The Angels Burned, Part 2.
It was gearing up to be a long night. The place was packed too deep with thirsty patrons, and our bar back was nowhere in sight. I wouldn't know it until hours later, but he'd quit out of the blue, leaving me to manage the tides myself. The entrance to our pub was tucked away inside a bricked alleyway, marked with a crooked street lamp. Beyond the frontage of oak and stained glass windows, the inside oozed with old-fashioned character. A western fireplace fitted with wrought iron pokers, rickety wooden stools, dozens of triple X whiskey water jugs hanging from the ceiling, and old world goods for display on the dark shelf lined walls. The perfect Old West backdrop for tourists. That's how all the seasons go in Vail, Colorado. When visitors weren't coming to freeze on the slopes, they came rolling in for the summer glamour, the velvety hills, and the smell of fireweed and creek water in the air. Stressful as it made my shift, as much as I wanted to wring the barback's neck for it, I was used to handling things on my own. It's how I cut my teeth in the bar trade, my rite of passage, as you might call it. Multitasking like a maniac, memorizing cocktail recipes, and answering the electrified calls of drunks, maybe a shot or two on the side to take the edge off. A few of my regulars were perched along the bar, a triad of glossy-lipped girls fresh in their college years. I could never remember their names, but I always remembered which of them tipped the best. As the three of them laughed noisily and shouted back and forth to each other, I kept an eye on the fellow two stools down from them. He strolled in just as they arrived and settled quickly at the bar. What are you thinking, boss? I asked, taking his order. Vodka, neat, he muttered with an inkling of drowsiness. Keep my tab open. His face matched the drink, a hard, marbled expression with nothing else mixed in, straight from the bottle to the glass. He wore a dark coat with a red cap, fighting to keep his ruffled hair from poking out. A beard enveloped his mouth and dangled under his chin like that of a billy goat. He'd been eyeballing the girls for a while, and noticeably, none of them cared for it. As two of the girls went to the restroom and one stayed behind, he took his chance. Busy as that night was, I couldn't help but watch him give it his best. A subtle gesture to her glass followed by a shake of her head. A little bit of chatter and another shake of her head. But Goatbeard would not be swayed, and I heard him asking something along the lines of, you smoke? Want to go out and smoke with me? I'm sorry, no, she said, turning her entire body to convey the end of their conversation. Finally, deterred, he left her alone and made his way around the tavern. Watching him rubber leg his way over to the dartboards, I wished I'd caught how drunk he was before pouring that last drink. He took a seat near a group of younger guys and watched their darts fly. Whenever one missed its mark or landed clear off the board, the boys, along with their new spectator, erupted with laughter. He leaned back, teasing the chair on its last two legs, and cackled loudly. Others looked over in curiosity and annoyance, until even the jukebox tunes were second to their horsey laughter. The group of guys didn't seem to mind it. They even welcomed it with one of them, enthusiastically high-fiving him. But eventually, the obnoxious chirtling wore out its welcome, and the group made their way elsewhere. Goatbeard followed and asked one of the boys something, the one that initiated the high-five. Judging by him tapping a V-shape against his lips, it seemed like another request to go out and smoke. The boy shook his head, denying the offer. Striking out twice, the man stumbled his way back to the bar and reclaimed his seat, hunched over like a brooding Paul Bunyan. He seemed anxious, hands clenched, fingers trembling. Soon enough, his neck arched back up to me and hollered, Hey, another neat, bud. Sorry, man, I replied, bringing him a glass of water. We're going to need you to slow down tonight. He eyed the water and then blinked bullets at me. What? 
Betrayal crossed his fleecy face like I had spat on a long-lived kinship. I had one shot, bud. Ain't even drunk yet. Now pour me another, all right? No drunk liked to be 86, but such things were necessary in the world of adult babysitting. I shook my head at him. Sorry, you have to sober up a bit. I'm not even drunk, he challenged me again, and then, not even a second after, he slammed both palms on the table. Now take my freaking order! He grabbed a glass and doused me with the water I'd poured for him. I signaled for our bouncer, who immediately made his way over and locked arms with the disturbance. Bastard, he yelled, digging his heels into the floor. My money's good here, damn it, my money's good here. As he was dragged out and his screams dissipated, onlookers returned to their drinks and conversations. I wiped off the water as well as I could and went back to work. It wasn't the first time I'd been swilled by an angry customer, and it most likely wouldn't be the last. Ten minutes after the last call, we stopped serving drinks. Thirty minutes after that, we emptied the bar and closed shop. I counted the money to make sure the checkout was correct and ran a cursory sweep over the place for any stragglers in the bathroom or under the booths. The last thing we needed was a drunkard waking up to their own alcoholic Wonka factory. The night air always tasted nicer after a long shift, especially if there wasn't the residue of vomit in the pavement or cigarettes in the air. I made a short walk to my car, parked in the space reserved for on-duty bartenders. Half the parking lot was glazed in the fluorescent light of a street lamp, while the other half was covered in 4 a.m. blackness. As I fished the keys out of my pocket and opened the door, a ring of icy steel pressed against the nape of my neck. Don't! A voice breathed from behind me as I reactively tried to move away from it. From the window I could make out the orange-dipped reflection of a man with a gun and tufty beard. Okay, okay. I said quietly, my hands pitifully up in front of me. Take it easy. I'll give you whatever you want. Shut up. Goatbeard grunted, digging the muzzle deeper into the scruff of my neck. Get in the car. I did as I was told and gripped the wheel. He circled to the passenger door, found that it was locked, and tapped the gun against the glass. Sure, I could have jammed the keys into the ignition and whipped the car into a screeching reverse, but the short seconds to do that felt much slower then a bullet smashing first through the window, then through my skull. I unlocked the door. He opened the door and seated himself, the snout of the firearm, still marked on me. Start the car. The engine rumbled awake. Good. He grinned, the light outside casting a grotesquely clear look of his sweaty pores. Something awful lingered in his breath, the foul musk of a rotted tooth. Now drive. The gravity of the situation hit me all at once. A blast of fear obliterating everything else out of my system. My inside shook like the temperature had just plummeted. I looked up at my own eyes in the rearview mirror. What I saw was undiluted fear and desperation. Please, I whimpered. I'm sorry for what happened. I really am, man. Take the car, it's yours. I won't... The hand holding the pistol slammed the dash. Drive! He screamed in an almost forlorn bellow. I dropped the gear shift into reverse. As the car backside turned and faced us toward the road, I shoved it into drive. Go west on the interstate, the man said, clicking in his seatbelt and gestured for me as well. How ironic. We followed the dark slit of road and slid up the ramp of I-70, heading into the gloomy darkness of the westbound highway. We drove in silence for some time, during which the tight panic in my chest had shifted to a hot anger. All this for a drink? Really? All this for a goddamn drink? I'd dealt with angry drunks before. Hell, I thought I'd dealt with the worst of them, but I hadn't seen nothing like this. This guy was an entirely new level, 
It was balls out insane. I slipped a glance at him. His eyes were turned vaguely toward the road. I hated everything about him. The shape in my peripheral, the awful smells wafting off him, his oafish breathing through those whiskers. Where are we going? What was going to happen when we got there? Whatever it was, I was running out of time. Hit the barrier, I thought, and grab the gun when he drops it out of his hand. I was tempted, even commencing countdowns in my head to swerve off the road and blindly grab him in the chaos. I eyed the orange needle of the speedometer, fluttering over 70 miles per hour. Bad idea. This was not about to become a scene in an action flick for an unscathed hero. It was real life, and in real life bodies hesitate, fingers pull triggers, and both people die in a fiery car crash. Where are you taking me? I finally asked, breaking the silence. Instead of a response, I caught the dim, grubby shape of his profile as he flicked open a lighter. Cigarette smoke wafted out of the mottled formations of his face. No open window for it to escape. I guess he'd finally found someone to smoke with. He instructed me to take the next exit and emerge on Highway 24 to follow the mountainside. At one point, a set of headlights came from the opposite direction. I pushed on the accelerator, bringing the needle up to an illegal 90, praying that it happened to be a cop ready to have us pulled over. My passenger didn't seem to notice our gradual rise in speed. As the car shot right by us, it was unfortunately a sedan, probably heading home to a safe, warm bed, a place I should be right now. A wet belch sighed out of him, and he sucked it back in. Digested alcohol now joined the smells of cigarette tar and a decaying tooth. I prayed for him to vomit, and for the vomit to clog up his throat and turn his face blue. What did he want? Kill me? Demand a ransom for me? My head ached with the possibilities. There had to be something I could do to get out of this. My son's birthday is next week, I lied, hoping some form of what would reach the sliver of humanity floating around him somewhere. He exhaled out a puff of smoke and that was all. He kept pushing. He wanted one of those small cars, the one you have to build the little plastic track for and everything. We were going to have a surprise birthday for him. Slow down, he blurted, signaling to an upcoming side road. Turn here. As the road became a C-shaped flank along the mountain, the turnoff practically came out of nowhere. Ahead of us, a large metal gate meant to block off the path had been left wide open. Someone had taken a pair of bolt cutters to the padlock, securing it. Hanging off of its side, a sign read in bold letters, Trespassers will be prosecuted. The road twisted into an aspen-lined path and became much grittier and less kept. Loose, rocky debris crunched under the tires, and a stray branch snapped like a femur bone. We maneuvered around a few large stones that had tumbled their way along the track. Houses clad in deformed shingles and decrepit sagging porches formed out of the darkness around us. Their walls had either crumbled entirely or were coated in elaborate graffiti, run down, abandoned. The old neighborhood sat in terrace-like rows along the mountainside, now left the slump along its incline. A ghost town, one of many that littered Colorado's terrain. Do you know this place? Goatbeard asked, surveying the deserted homes himself. I'll give you a clue. Silverboom of the 1800s, once at the dead center of all zinc and lead mining productions. Back then, anyway. I wasn't interested in answering him, and in response to my silence, he shook at his rugged head. Gilman, come on, bud. You don't know your own state's history? The sudden shift in tone irked me greatly, like this kidnapping had become a friendly outing together. 
Screw you, my thoughts grunted. Without being prompted, Goatbeard continued. In 1899, half the mining town was wiped out. The school, the Iron Mask Hotel, the Shaft House. Poof. He flexed his fingers. All lost to the fire. Why are you telling me this? His drunken eyes found me again. Do you know what the townsfolk did? They came together and rebuilt what was lost. Made it better. A tragedy made into a communion. Do you know what I mean? I didn't answer. Forest fires, those are tragedies, right? Wrong. They clear out the dead litter, make room for new generations of growth. Thriving in the ashes. That's what we need, you know? That is what this cold, cold world needs. He was slurring to himself more than to me now. Men, women, everyone out there prays to some distant god, crying for the angels to fly down and save us. But he's out of angels to send. So we must abide. We must make them. His gaze shifted, a bent smile forming in the scruff. Thank you. He almost wept. Thank you for making me choose you. Truly, it was a sudden giddiness in his voice that scared the most out of me. Like the very reason he drank himself half to death tonight had finally been resolved. The neighborhood led us to the town area where we passed an old workshop, a sun-bleached garage, and two Gilman dump trucks, their sides plastered with ancient mud. From out of the cracks, weeds had pushed their way through the un tended turf. We're here. Stop. Goatbeard snapped as he rolled down the window to flick out his cigarette. We came to a stop before a large boxy building. Though it was one of the many paint-flaking fossils surrounding us, this structure looked especially dismal. Its once white coat was murky with age. The few windows that weren't clouded with grime were entirely blown out, their bits of glass shimmering like teeth in the moonlight. More graffiti lined its base, in one of which sat the gray outline of a cat, and sprouting atop the structure's roof sat a single cracked chimney. Shut it off, Goatbeard ordered again, gesturing obnoxiously toward my keys and then grabbing them as I did so. Out from the building's dark entryway a silhouette came. My insides rippled with fear at the sight. This was it, the end of our journey together. Of course, this would be the perfect place to make me disappear. Nobody would know, and even if someone found me, they'd only stumble upon my corpse, rotting like everything else in this toxic place. I was done playing ball. This was going to end my way, not theirs. As Goatbeard moved to open his side of the car, I snatched at his gun. His fingers locked around my wrist and jerked to the side to spin the barrel away from me. Its nozzle smacked against the dashboard, but his grip remained locked tight around it. I yanked again, harder this time, using whatever leverage I could muster, in the tight little space we were in. The parts of his face still visible to me were screwed with anger. Son of a bitch! He screamed, trying to wrestle my hands off of him, growling like an angry dog. My thoughts were loud, screaming in unified chorus. Take it, take it, take it. That's all I cared about, all I wanted in the world. To take it meant the end of this horrible night, to live through it. I pried desperately at his grubby fingers, feeling them starting to break their hold. As from out of nowhere, a calloused fist struck my face. Pressure filled the inside of my cheek and made it clench. His free hand struck again, even harder this time. My head flopped back, but my hand only clutched tighter. Then there was a sound behind me, and a pair of hands ripped me right out of the driver's seat. The underside of my legs scraped painfully across the gravel, and before everything stopped spinning, I was pinned on my stomach. A broad knee dug between my shoulders. Something looped around my wrists, 
then bit into them as tight bracelets. Zip ties. Easy. Easy, guy. A new voice spoke, infuriatingly calm. I heard the passenger side close as Goatbeard bustled over to join whoever had a hold of me. I spat and cursed at them, feeling bits of sharp grit pushed into my cheek. He's a troublemaker. Goatbeard jeered, hawking a gob of mucus on me. My teeth ached and the blood was rushing to my left cheek, probably swelling like a balloon. Without warning, the two men yanked me up to my knees, crammed something into my mouth, and slapped a streak of duct tape over my lips. I'll put a muzzle on him. Goatbeard chuckled, proud of himself. The man who had just pushed his fingers into my mouth nodded. He was much taller, with a bristled, frosty chin and a nose permanently bent to the side. Listen, he spoke with that collected voice. If you keep causing trouble, I'll have to take this. He held up a knife and pressed it up to my groin. Now zip your sack. So behave, huh? We stopped struggling at the sight of it. Whatever they just shoved in my mouth rolled along my tongue. It felt like a tablet, some kind of drug, maybe. No way I was going to swallow it, but that wouldn't stop it from dissolving anyway. We need to hurry, Goatbeard mumbled, to which Bent Nose nodded and led me into the wretched building. Inside, they walked me down a short, cramped hallway. The air I had to force in and out of my nostrils was stale and feverishly thick. Mold had built up and crawled down the wall from the ceiling, trailing along the cracks. The interior of the room we entered resembled kind of workshop, somewhat lit by a flashlight propped up on a table. In its beam, someone else had their back to us. A hunching figure with a veiny bald head and a rawhide coat that hung off his wiry frame. He was dipping his fingers into what looked like a jar and smearing it in oval strokes on the wall, humming a hymn while he did so. Piled along the left flank of the wall were heaps of worn medical equipment, pushed aside and left in a dusty pile. Paper and negatives from an x-ray were littered all over the floor. This was a hospital, or at least something along the lines of one. Behind the mound of grimy equipment, a woman was hunched against the wall, her dark eyes peered up from the duct tape, cheeks creased with eye shadow, and her face sagging with the weight of hopelessness. As our eyes met, neither found comfort in the other. I felt the urge to gag as the thing in my mouth melted into a bitter glaze. It tasted horrible. Are we ready? Goatbeard asked from behind me, his gun pressed firmly into my spine. Almost. Skinny replied, turning his pointy face toward us, before returning to the thing he was creating. His wide eyes held a fierce intensity behind them. Bent Nose joined him, grabbing a jar of his own and streaking the same circled pattern over the next half of the room. Dozens were on the walls. Large red circles filled with six inner rings, grayish chalky writing that had been scribbled into them. Not words at all, but layers upon layers of gibberish, all winding toward the sphere's center. They seemed like sigils, like ones you might find in a cult. That explained Goatbeard's crazy speak. But what was this, really? Our captors didn't strike me as cultists with robes and hidden hooded faces. They were more a gang of scruffy misfits showing off their toys. I looked at the woman. Her eyes had gone elsewhere, swaying and wobbling around the room. Muffled, droning sounds buzzed behind the duct tape. She was on something, probably the same thing they force-fed me, to keep us muzzled. All right! Skinny spoke excitedly, clapping his spattered hands. Who should we start with? Her! Bent nose spoke, gesturing to the girl who continued to sway and teeter in her corner. Skinny looked at the woman, then blinked back at him with irritation. What are you doing? Where are her restraints? 
Bentner scoffed at him. She's high as a kite. Wouldn't even notice a fly on her face right now. That isn't the point, Skinny snapped. Do you want this to end like the Mousleys? Think. Musing on that, Bent Nose fastened the cables over her wrists and yanked her off the ground, her bare feet dragging along the floor. As she was laid in the center of the room, she rested whimsically on her back, putting up as much fight as a sex doll. He ripped the duct tape from her mouth before leaving her there. A pause fell over the room, and then the men began to chant in unison. It swelled from their throats, pulling straight from the chest and meshing together in a low, prolonged baritone. In the poor acoustics of the room, their voices bounced off the stained walls, gaining more volume with an unmistakable, deep, powerful devotion. Between their vocals, Skinny spoke out, straining his lungs into some gravel-throat language. I was starting to feel clammy and prickly all over the place. My mind focused on breathing, sucking in the awful fumes around me of body odor and decay. As my heart pumped frantically, I tried to focus on its rhythm, tried to ignore the sounds of the vibrating vocal cords rumbling my ears. I forced down a swallow and breathed. The drug couldn't be affecting me now, could it? This quickly? The walls around us didn't feel like walls anymore, but massive slabs of canvas coated in waxy circles. Awful art. Horrible, awful art. The voices rose, heaving out of their vocals even louder. My leg muscles squeezed together, then relaxed, like taffy being rolled and stretched from a machine. I wanted to sit down, to sit down and breathe. But as I started to drift downward, Goatbeard forcefully hoisted me back up again. I'd forgotten he was there. Are you feeling it? Are you feeling the good stuff yet? His words trickled with him, a warm, rotted breath. Whatever harness keeping my thoughts together was loosening. I wanted to squeeze into one of the cracks around us, to sleep and make the bad world go away. The walls started to move, puffing in and out in perfect tandem with my wheezing chest. In. Out. In. Out. Even the sigils moved, shivering their waxy bodies with the dark chorus. Within them, the chalky figures danced and wriggled with such life, I almost believed they each had their own pulse. That was when I saw the fire. It clawed over her, starting as a bluish ripple that quickly flared into a bright, savage red. Even as the burst of heat rolled over my face, I didn't think it was real. The men hadn't ignited her, or doused her in anything, or even flicked a match. A hallucination, that's it. I'm hallucinating. My mind pleaded, trying to grip its last fibers of that harness. But the sound of her screaming is what made it real. She bucked and writhed beneath the flames, crying out for any of us to help her. Smoke burrowed into my nostrils and bristled the back of my throat. I retched emptily into the duct tape and tried to pull away, only to be forced back toward her. Watch! Goatbeard hissed, only stopping his chance to whisper into my ear. Watch the angels shine! I could smell her hair burning, her skin roasting. Faces appeared around her, forming with the blaze, and then in the same instant rippled into the smog. She screamed until her throat split and her echoes fell to a dry, breathless yowl. The ties binding her hands had finally snapped and released them to flail helplessly about. All the while, the strident chants continued, feeding the inferno as it spat more pieces of her into the air. They sang, they cheered, and as their shadows throbbed up and down the walls, I could swear those changed as well. Oily shapes with bodies contorted and torturously stretched into things not even remotely human. Skinny stood the closest to the burning woman, both hands raised in sadistic glee over their living kindle. 
Just another man outside these walls, but here in the firelight, he looked like the devil. Psychopaths. Monsters. I fought in Goatbeard's grip, jerking my head back to break his nose, kicking my feet backward toward his knees. I couldn't stomach anymore. Something blunt struck the back of my head. I keeled over onto my knees, even in a drugged-up daze. The static spreading around my skull told me I'd just been pistol-whipped. The last of the strained cries finally crept from the woman's throat as she succumbed to a crackling silence. I thought she was finally gone, prayed for it even. However, she convulsed once more, turning her stomach up and letting her head hang downward, now looking at me. I saw her face clearly. Her skin resurfaced with blisters and curling raw patches, her nose a mottled stump of white seared tissue, and the last remnants of her hair coiling against the ruined scalp. Then her lips, which had dried to thin scabs, suddenly parted. I expected another hellish scream to empty out of her, but it was something else. A warped laugh only possible with a throat full of charcoal, laughing hysterically in an upside-down grimace. Though no eyes were left in her sockets, I could feel their gaze swallow me up. Stop, I whimpered internally. Please stop looking at me. Her suffering had ended, but in its place, something different had taken its place, clawing its way out of the burn. The laughing seized as she struggled back to her feet, standing tall in the lashing flames. Fragments of clothing hung from a grizzled frame, fused to the skin. The chorus of the men had stopped as they backed away from her, like lion tamers who suddenly lost their whips. She seemed to pay them no mind as her neck slowly swiveled around the room, eyeing up each of the hastily smeared sigils. Her heels scraped against the floor as she chose one of them and gradually shambled toward it. Upon reaching the crest, her body collapsed forward. A skull-rending crunch resounded from the impact and left her limply against it. Pieces of her torso, followed by everything else, began to fall away from her, dispersing in blackened particles. The flames shrank and sputtered as more of her body broke down into fine-grained piles around her. Before long, she had crumbled to nothingness, a vague smear of her existence marred into the wall. As the last of the embers fizzled in their ashes, the room returned to its heavy darkness. Beautiful, Skinny cheered, looking like he'd just wiped away a tear, though it was probably to rub the sweat off of his face. Those wide, intense eyes traveled to me. One down, one to go. I looked once more at the crest in the wall, smothered by the leftover shape of a woman. Then I was on the ground, staring up at the ceiling. They'd left me in the same spot, peppered with their ashes. Beneath me, the scorched floor burned against my spine. Goatbeard smiled as he tore the duct tape from my mouth. Why? So they could hear me scream again? My limbs had jellied into uselessness. Maybe from the fear, or maybe from whatever godforsaken substance they'd forced into my system. Tears welled up in my eyes. I thought about my parents' faces and the last time I'd seen them. I thought about my first bar gig and how many times I'd messed up the mixes. An angry shout tried to tear out of my throat, but was rasped short by how raw it had become. I didn't want to die. Not here. Not in this demonic place. When the chanting started again, I squeezed the tears shut and prayed for my nerves to burn quickly. Then the sound stopped. Silence stilled the room, save for a few scraping feet. What was that? Bent Nose spoke. You hear that? Go check it out, Skinny ordered, as a set of shoes pattered out of the room. A few anxious mumbles passed between them and Goatbeard, until a flurry of shouts rang from the hallway. Both of them beat past me and ran toward the disturbance. Something surged through my body. 
and electricity which kicked my limbs from their paralysis and back to working order. I pulled my upper half from the ground and into a sitting position. Once my feet were under me, I got myself back to standing. Just being vertical again filled me with absolute joy. The sounds from outside came as incoherent barks from the hall until they were silenced by a loud crack, then two more in its place. Gunshots. I pulled my arms below my body and carefully lifted one leg at a time over my wrists, bringing them back to the front of me. After that, I brought both over my head and threw them down onto my stomach. The ties didn't break. I tried again, raising them as high as I could. Break, you bastards! And slammed them down even harder. The locking mechanism snapped, finally freeing my hands. From behind the thin walls, shuffling movements registered from the outside. My ear! A voice bellowed, sounding very much like Goatbeard's slurred speech. Shut my ear! Car doors opened and closed as an engine revved to life and an accelerator was depressed. They sped off, retreating from something. As I twisted myself toward the exit, a man was now standing there, his gun pointed at me. Stay away, I screamed haggardly at him. Stay the hell away from me. Take it easy. I'm not one of them, the man said, lowering his weapon, a whole new face in the fray. We stood at an impasse inside the acrid unlit room. I wanted to believe he was my rescue, but my nerves were shot. The fact that things around me hadn't stopped moving didn't help. His eyes scanned the workshop and settled on the human-shaped scar on the wall. A look of familiarity tensed his features. Do you know where you are right now? Were you forced to come here? Please, I breathed. Just let me get out of this place. He nodded in agreement and led the way through the narrow hallway. The fresh night air prickled down my throat and coughed back out of me. I bent over and retched into the ground. The ashes were all over me, on my clothes, in my hair. The stranger retreated from me, almost like he was expecting something to suddenly happen. When nothing did, he cautiously drew closer. My name's Tucker. Can, he, can you tell me yours? Peter, I responded, blowing the remaining spittle off my lips. Are you a cop? I used to be. He itched the back of his neck, then continued. I need you to tell me everything that happened here, Peter. Everything that you can remember. Can you do that for me? I looked up at him and rubbed the imprints dented into my wrists. You're not going to believe any of it. The ex-officer then smiled. Try me. I hope you enjoyed The Angels Burned, Part 2, by author Michael Page, as performed by yours truly. From what I understand, Mr. Page has even more coming for this series, but, spoiler alert, I'm pretty sure the young lady won't be coming back. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author can be found by visiting our website, just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash page. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash P-A-I-G-E. Come for the WordPress blog or visit one of his social media accounts. Either way, there's a taste of the macabre there for you to have. As a reminder, if you decide to give any of this talented author's stories a read, please consider leaving them a quality review and a kind word or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. And be sure to let them know you heard about them on this program and that me, Otis Chiry, sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure Michael would much appreciate it also. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me here for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page 
or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>